Welcome to Playing With Fire, the podcast for people who are ready to custom build their love. We're talking about non-monogamy, however you design it, as an individuation opportunity. Want to leave the default and make your life spectacularly you? You're in the right place. I think what we're talking about today is possibly the most ubiquitous and least conscious aspect of all of my work with people. Well, it sure seems to have come up a lot lately from the conversations you've had with me. Yeah. Power dynamics, power exchange, power in relationships, um, power. power. <laughs> I, okay. So when, when I think about, um, discussing power with people, I'm instantly like, Oh, okay. We are entering into really big territory. And often people don't realize that we're entering into big territory, but, um, I want to talk about this with you because I use some language from the kink world, from the BDSM world that I learned, that I practice. I use that in my relationship with you and when appropriate in my relationships with other people. But I've noticed that I've also sort of like soaked in this language long enough that it feels normal to me to talk about power and how power works in relationships. And I am noticing that that is not the case. So we've had lots of conversations about power over time and um power over time that sounds like a physics thing. Yeah, I think it is. I think it's impulse or something. But um uh Okay, now I actually want to do the math. Now I'm confused. Yeah. Okay. Um so we have these conversations, we have shared language about it, but if we're going to talk about it out in the world, we should define some terms. Right. So I think we should start with the the only place I know where it is common to talk about power dynamics and power exchange in um, intimate relationships, which is the kink world. And I think this particular book, Playing Well with Others, by Lee Harrington and Melina um, Williams, I think that this particular book is a great basic primer on kink, on BDSM, on, on that whole world. And one of the reasons is because there's a glossary. I love me a good glossary. You do, defining terms. So Gee. here's the trick. Uh, when I look up power exchange in the glossary of playing well with others, I find C also, D-S-M-S, -S, dominance, submission, um, masochism, sadism, master, slave, right? Um, but the definition itself is an interpersonal association in which the participants mutually consent to assume or yield authority. Now, when I talk to people in relationships who are especially people who are struggling with making agreements, who are struggling with um, feeling like their needs are getting met, they're struggling to navigate change and transition in their relationships. Often I hear this really juicy subtext of um, unexamined, power exchange. But the thing is, that's, that's a little different from this definition. This definition specifically says that power exchange is about mutually consented mm -hmm. to assume uh, assumption or, or, or giving of authority. In other words, I could work with you and you could say, let's negotiate for a power exchange. And you and I could go through lots of talks about exactly what that's going to mean. What authority are you giving to me? What am I doing with that like all of that privilege that you've now handed me if I'm in the top position or I'm in the dominant position. That's not what most of us were taught to do in our relationships. No, when when you and I started our relationship, and in fact, even yeah, right at the beginning, when we were still working out a triad and everything, and there were some conversations about why... Why are you seeing so many things through the lens of power? I saw, because, I saw power struggles everywhere. Because when I came into this relationship, I didn't think psychologically at all. So also, look at me. I'm a middle-aged white man with privilege beyond, you know, beyond what's, reasonable. beyond what's reasonable, for sure. For sure. So 
I was like, what, what do you mean power? Why is this all about power? I have all the power I need, apparently, <laughs> was like my standpoint. It's like, I don't even think about power because I automatically just have it. So why are we talking about it? So I was coming into that relationship facing what I now know to be couples privilege. Um, you had an established yes. marriage that I was, I was being given some rights to sort of operate near, not even within really. Um, hmm. And yeah. there was this like steep dynamic of power because that was also present because we were opening a business together and because we had um, sexual desires for each other that also were were not clear and it was hard to talk about them. And that, so that added another layer of mm -hmm. power. And we had children who we were raising in the same household. So, so now there are other like issues. Parental of power, authority parental authority and right? what's happening there. Now to mention the fact that we, we still operated in this world and this world. So we are happen to be in Massachusetts in the United States. I can't, we can't turn anywhere and pretend like we are not operating in a power structure. I mean, no. we just are. So for me, at the beginning of our relationship, I struggled because I instantly felt like I was being um, controlled and I, I was really, really struggling. And I was at the time divorcing someone and feeling very clearly how in marrying this person, I had signed papers and... Um, I had gotten married in a state that says, hey, if once you get married, you share everything. And so I was extricating myself from a relationship that was also all tied up with power, it turns out. And then we were in the divorce process, which is often also mired in unspoken, unnamed power manipulations, power and games. So now have I said power enough times? Well, um... so that's where I was. You And I remember you telling me, like, seems like you see everything through the lens of power. And, you know, I, we just don't see it that way. And I remember crying myself. I'm so see. sorry about that because, and. Because then I felt like a bad person yeah. for simply naming the fact that I was, I felt very, very confused and disempowered. I was trying to name this gap and. You, uh, your defense, what I now see as a defense was, I think that's just your immature way of looking at things, right? It was a nice trick. Nice it, magic that trick. Was some, it well, that's, a couple years. Well, projection is a very magic trick. Yeah. And just approaching something without looking at all of the pieces of the system, which in this world includes power, because we influence each other. Right. We interact with each other. So we have power over and between each other. And if we don't talk about it, which is the approach that I had taken in my previous relationship, the one you were walking into. The one I was walking into yep. and interacting directly yeah. with. In, in that relationship, we never talked about these things. So what you were talking about power exchange out of that book, there couldn't be consent because we never talked about it. Right. And it was never a topic of conversation. That's how I know now that we were in an unnegotiated, unreflective power dynamic that yeah. therefore became abusive and that I willingly stayed there. So I, I want to own that fully. I willingly stayed there. I didn't feel like I had any other options. And that's a bigger conversation. But I also was very used to operating under control. I grew up in a household where there was a clear um, hierarchy, lots of lots of power and control games, and specifically um, one where my father liked to take the one down position and sort of pretend like my mother was in charge of everything, while also nothing got like his word was the final word as well so. because he would get big, he would get really really big, and he would get really really loud, and my mother would crumble eventually. And then something interesting happened. I grew up and I'm, I stand five feet tall and my father was like six, three, but I learned that the only way to deal with power was to step all the way into it. So you met me at a time when I'd already spent 30 years stepping right up toe to toe with mm -hmm. his power and saying, I will not shrink. I will not shrink from you. I will stand right here. It doesn't surprise me that we struggled with power and when I, but, but it also does surprise me that we got through it. 
<laughs> that uh, totally that that is surprising. I pulled up another definition that I think would be. Oh, helpful. what you got? Well, just the word power itself. Um, as soon as I start thinking about power, I start thinking about control. Okay. Because so frequently, any num any of us might be in a spot where we're like, I just need to control things. I just I need to have control over the situation. I need control so I feel safe. Um, and I find it interesting how this, this, these words go together, but a simple definition for control is the power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. Okay. And so you and I have talked quite a lot about how when people are non-monogamous, often the thing that they're most afraid of losing is influence. influence. And th this mm -hmm. is where I feel like um, the conversation gets a little bit more nuanced when we talk about influence versus control. Many people are like, no, 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 no. It's not about control. I don't want to control my partner. And my more tender question would be, yeah, but are you, have you reflected on what it feels like for you when there are multiple sources of influence in your partner's life? Because that's going to happen when we expose ourselves to multiple relationships. Right. So I showed up in your world and one of the things that I know I did was instantly start influencing you partially because you thought I was hot and wanted to sleep with me, but not just that. No. You also wanted to listen to me. You saw, you heard things from me and all of a sudden I, I, I knew I had influence and I wouldn't have said I had control over you. It sure didn't feel like I did, but I absolutely was trying to influence you. And this is what I see happen in people's relationships all day, every day, is there's this, this intensity of what do I have control over? Where is my power? Do I feel empowered? Am I in control? Are they controlling me? Is this controlling? And yet I rarely hear anyone outside of the kink world, outside of the specific world where we're like, I'm going to play with this dynamic. I rarely hear anyone talk about how they consent to power sharing in their intimate relationships like on the on that everyday yeah level where, mm -hmm. like in your agreements and in your, in your and in agreements your, yeah so when you were talking about coming in and influencing me um we didn't i think we didn't know to talk about that partially because i hmm, it, it gets very tangled for me very quickly because earlier today you said something about um when when there's when there's control when there's influence but it's just what's normal it's just what people do and here's the thing there is like so we were friends we went from we had a friendship friends before the um to lovers to partners yeah yeah and during the friendship i was absolutely influenced by you and right um i mean and i, I brought you like I put you into contact with things. I exposed mm -hmm. you to ideas. I, you yes. homeschooled your children because I yep. I influenced you. I, I was biased. I liked homeschooling. I definitely, and I was like, great. I would love it if you guys homeschooled too. Awesome. We talked about it all the time. And even, if you, even if you hadn't like pushed or, or, you know, engaged in the, I think this would be good for you and your kids and everything. Even if you hadn't had that conversation, you were doing it. Just by doing that, you were influencing me because now that was in my imagination in a way that it wasn't before. Yeah. And I'm not sure I did. I'm not sure I was like, I don't remember you doing that. I mean, you would, buy, you would let us borrow books to read about it. Yeah. Which I don't think we read, apparently. <laughs> it's done. It's for me, oh, things went for, um, under the bridge. Well, the kids are all graduated now. Yeah, they're fine. Um, when but my point is that here we are, we're, we're friends and we influence each other. And we all, I think, well, we accept it because if you're going to be friends with somebody, rarely, you know what? Okay. I Maybe I shouldn't speak from my own experience. When I go to be friends with somebody, I'm like, hey, so what's your world like? I'd like to learn from it. Boom, I'm being influenced. Right. Okay. Because take this back to another realm, right? Can you put two elements next to each other and have them like, how do they interact or not interact? Like interaction means change, right? That's right. Yeah. Otherwise, like two inert things can sit next to each other, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't have to change. I'm not inert. You are not inert. No. Um, so do not, in, like, and and I have had people, I've been a full no for people who are like, ooh, 
you inspire a lot more movement, dynamic ideas in the world. I'm going to, I'm a no on that. In fact, I lost a best friend not that long ago because bottom line, I think I had too many thoughts and ideas. <laughs> and, and if you want to stay the same and are surrounded by new ideas, you can't. Even if you're trying to stay the same, the ideas are there. You've heard them. Now they're in your brain. Your brain's changed. Oh, oh no. I've had people say that about my work. They're like, you know what? I really don't want to know that there are happy non-monogamous people out there. Oh, okay. I like I would just really rather not know that because I would rather keep things simple, follow the 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 basic rules of monogamy as they are, and just live on what they call a normal life. And as soon as they know that in fact some people are happy having their proverbial cake and eating it too, they can't unknow it. They can't go back to a state where they didn't know it. And so now they have to face the fact that they are choosing monogamy. And mm. that's great. For me, I'm like, that's great. Monogamy's wonderful. Go for it. And know that you're choosing it. It's this idea that there's a default. So control, power, uh, you know, and presumed norms are all at play all the time in our life. So you said, you know, I upset the apple cart of your life through my influence. Mm -hmm. You had leaned so heavily into the norms while pretending you didn't. Right. You were an iconoclast. Sure. You were quite, I mean, but I remember. Oh, like, yeah. Were, that's what I was. Widely known I wanted, to be I wanted different. to be known as an iconoclast. Right. Did I do iconoclastic things? Not the way you did. Well, you know, and, and not very I much. That reputation. And you didn't have that reputation, but that's, you were constantly challenging norms and not, but not just to challenge norms to see, could this be better? Oh, I, that well, would be better for me. I had a tendency to, um, to go against the grain and to take a lot of action. Yeah. You had a tendency to see yourself, perceive yourself as someone who went against the grain. Those are two different things. Completely different things. It's a little embarrassing to hear you describe it that way because it's so accurate. I just think that it meant that you had a way of thinking about yourself that left you um, unable to see many of the realities right. of how your relationship's working. So power was at work in your relationships. Yeah. Control was yeah. at work. As soon as I brushed up against the control and power, I, I leaned into it and then I started taking action. I started yep. reading, I started devouring books and I started looking for and, and looking for resources to help me understand. And one of the resources I found was the world of kink. And I was like, oh, in the kink world, people are talking about power exchange as something that needs to be negotiated, needs to be made as transparent as possible, needs to be able to be freely consented to, which means we have to be able yeah. to provide informed consent. It, just think about how different that is from anything you learned before you got married the first time. Nobody said any of those things. No one said any of those things. Not not in my premarital counseling, not, not going to close. like, no. And, you know, I don't think, but we, we that doesn't absolve me from participating in my unreflective first marriage. But now I watch people frequently who are in very long-term relationships. You know, there'll be more than a dozen years in some of them many decades in and it's like getting a bucket of ice water over their heads to find out that they have been living their their life without having actively negotiated their power dynamics it, it, and and seen them as something that is negotiable um and that doesn't mean that they're not doing power exchanges they're just not making it clear to themselves right but then when stuff... Which is interesting, because I, I agree with that. Like, we, uh, there are levels on which we have not had explicit conversations about oh. exactly how we are... Yeah, we don't do this perfectly. ...exchanging power and things like that. And um, and yet we muddle along and we, you know, we, we work through things. And in the definition of power exchange that was in that book, like, if you haven't talked about it, if you haven't been explicit 
about who's doing what and and how that's working. Yeah, where your that's not are. an exchange. That's something else. Yeah, and that can vary from my, my own experience. I have coerced you. You know, I'm not sitting over here thinking. You know, no, it's not, no, it's not like that. No. It's more um, I manipulate without even and thinking about it. I'm like doing too. things to try to get you to move in the directions I want you to go. Me too. Um, Absolutely, I have found you to be incredibly manipulable. Uh, like, I I could say this in a way that makes me look better, but well, here's right. the thing: like you have been so easily um, swayed by my opinions oh. and my feelings, yeah, because... especially my feelings, which I didn't take that seriously, but you did. <laughs> yeah, that I could change your mind and change what you were doing and honestly even change your values like your priority and values well and just because i think this is interesting i'm not sure how well it totally dovetails to our topic here um before our relationship we talked about me like wanting to be known as an iconoclast yeah i have a lifetime's worth of habits manipulating other people's perceptions managing other people's perceptions of me that makes me so manipulatable because it's all about what are you thinking? What are you feeling? How are you how are you seeing me? And if you know that's happening and you know how to make me yes. feel like you're not seeing me the way I want to, and yeah. the thing that I would need to do to make you see me that way is what you want me to do, boom. Are you exposing my magic trick, sir? Sir. I'm not supposed to the magician's code. <laughs> sir okay it's yeah it's true well here's because the thing cared about i know that happens not how it was i know it happens still works <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah as recently as like this past week yeah absolutely yep. and sometimes i'll tell you like i feel myself i can feel how i mm -hmm. am my my less conscious parts are manipulating you and some of my conscious parts start to notice and i'm like and do I keep going and your skills or do I call oh. myself in right. about this and say, I see what I'm doing here. And I'm, I might need to excuse myself from this situation so that you can really reflect and get centered and grounded yourself and come into this conversation, knowing that I'm a strong negotiator. Yeah. And so you might need to like pull your panties all the way up and really be ready to come into a discussion with yep. me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm getting more comfortable with those uh, situations where you're like, okay, we need to we need to separate now. And I've started to learn that one of the reasons is for my protection. You're like, yeah. I don't want to be manipulating you now. You go away. We'll recenter ourselves and come back and actually right. communicate. Um, right. And that's for me, that's about my taking responsibility for my own stated value right. of staying in integrity with fully negotiating my relationships to the best of my possible ability. And that means not using some of my trickier, sneakier skills. Yep. And it's tempting to, it is. So here's, here's how this circles back to the power exchange that we're talking about is that's what this is. This is what, that's what this is headed toward, but only if we talk about it. Can you say that again differently? Um, all of the, the, those those magic tricks of manipulating me, mm -hmm. the way I coerce and manipulate you, the things we're doing could be fine if we had already talked about oh, them. Absolutely. If so we had said, "Hey, this is what we're going to do," and in this situation, I'm going to be doing these things, and you're going to respond, right? And and it, does that work for you? So, and I will say those. yes because I know this happens. We've mm -hmm. had the conversations. Um, so I'm like, yes, we, we can continue. Right. It doesn't stop you from saying, you know what, that's not what I want to do right now. Right. Cause so we're going to separate. Because in order for it to be consent, we need to both be able to withdraw consent. That's right. Um, so, which is why we have safe words just for our everyday life, mm -hmm. not just for kink scenes. A safe word is a word that just, okay, it stops the scene. And now we need to like draw on all of our resources. One of the, one of the things I see happening here is there's. There is, <laughs> there is such a beauty to making your power dynamic clear oh. and visible because, oh, is there? because like you said, you can know that I'm manipulating you and, and really be happy about it because we also get in our own way. Mm -hmm. My shadow parts and my younger parts, they don't all align with my adult self self's decisions, values. They don't keep me in alignment with my integrity completely. So 
one of the tools I have at my disposal is to say, to notice one is one of the ways that we interact that gets me what I really want and then negotiate with you mm -hmm. for how that plays out. So I think giving an example for this will be helpful. Um, I have a really hard time being in my body, like a really hard time being embodied is challenging. I am one of those people who probably from the first breath I took is like, do I really have to be here? Like seriously on earth? I'm not totally sure why I incarnated, but here I am. So being in a body is challenging. And sometimes I'm completely overwhelmed, wrought. But I also was taught as a child not to cry. Um, crying was not allowed unless you were angry. And so I have a really hard time with the fact that sometimes my body needs me to cry, needs me to go through sadness. But all of me is not on board with that and doesn't have access to it. And so, and you are a very nice person. You're not always good, but you're very nice. I am much nicer than I am good. <laughs> That's true. Okay. And so you can see me needing to cry. And for years, this went on. You could see me like with all these feelings and all this frustration. And you were too nice to help me. Yep. But eventually we got our dynamic worked out well enough that we negotiated around how I wanted to be treated in those moments. Uh, and that, and I got really, really explicit about how I have, there are a couple of avenues the, because not everybody's into hearing depictions of heavy kink scenes. Let's keep it simple. One of them was, okay, assign me a ridiculous workout. Mm -hmm. So at, at the time when we were working out all the time, there were workouts that you knew would make me cry. And I could intentionally say, I'm going to need you to hold me to this. Make me go out to the floor today. And you would take that. You would take on the trainer persona. And so this is so far out of a like a typical kink dynamic, but you would put on your trainer persona. And this could be in our actual gym or just at home. And you would, yep, just get me into that mode, which was, you know, a little like part, one part drill sergeant, one part loud, you know, rap music in the background. And, and then re reminding me to pick up the bar, pick up the bar, pick up the bar. And if I did that for, you know, whether it was a seven minute workout or an hour long workout, doesn't even matter at the end of it, I would cry. Mm -hmm. And then I could actually have feelings. And all of that for us was almost identical to every kink dynamic we have. Right. It's it's almost identical. So if you want to insert heavy scene play into there, if you want to imagine me giving you that depiction, okay, um, go ahead, have at it. Um, it's the same. And yeah. it's the negotiation about, about how we will enter into it. Like you actually put on some regalia, you like got yourself into that position because mm -hmm. you tend not to be a dominant person, but you get yourself into that. I put myself, I, tr I entrust you with like, I can't handle this right now. And then afterwards, you knew to take care of me. Like, so we pre-negotiated aftercare. Again, normal in the kink world. Right. Not very typical in your day-to-day -day marriages and long-term relationships, but I wish it were. I wish I it do. were. I do too. Post-argument aftercare. Yeah. Yes. Yep. The... Um... Wow. So there were so many things in over the course of my relational life where I thought, well, everybody knows this, right? And this is just how it goes. And I'm supposed to know. So I'm not supposed to ask. So we're just supposed to improv this whole thing. Oh, you mean life? Yeah. Life and relationships and dealing with a partner being upset or happy. Like, okay, so I got to wing this now. What's What should happen now? I should know. I should know my partner well enough to know what should happen. Oh, now. and then from my side, he should know me well and enough. And you should know me well enough. You should know me well enough to know. I mm -hmm. shouldn't have to say it. Well, pro tip, if you want to know somebody, ask them questions about the thing you want to know about. Yeah. Have but, conversations. But, but this thing fair, gets in the way. This got in the way of me having those conversations. Real romance, that mm, truly, yeah. truly having a romantic, intimate, deep connection means knowing the other beyond what they have asked for yeah beyond what they have explicitly talked about gotta tell you that is just the least romantic thing in the world it produces some really crappy interactions 
And it, it actually overlooks, we've talked about this before, it overlooks the primary mind reading technology we have. Words? Words. Yeah. And those can be spoken words or written words. Yeah. If you actually get, I get nonverbal. I have had to write things down or go find a page in a journal and show you and be like, this, this is my feelings now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I feel very childish when that happens. And it's still true. Yeah. I, so I can feel childish. I can feel bad about myself, but it's still how I am. That's how we, we, we're all, I mean, I have, I have childish parts. I was struggling with mine just today. Um, and pretending I don't is how I used to deal with it. It's like, oh, what I'll just, I'll just cover that childish part up with this persona that I'm supposed to be to the people in my life. So that's at the core of this all. When I'm working with couples who've been together, in particular couples who've been together a long time, right? So they sit in their relationship, they are inside of the norms. They are, they tend to be married. They tend to have followed a set of, of relationship norms, right? A relational escalator. They've done the things. They bought the house. They ha have the business. They have the kids. They raised the kids. They did, they did the things. And they followed the scripts. And to some extent, this worked really well. They were successful by the metrics that society judges us by. Right. But along the way, they developed a lot of resentment about all the stuff that wasn't being understood and seen and wasn't being talked about. And they could keep themselves busy for just so long, right? You can keep yourselves busy, especially while you're in the establishing yourself in the world phase and the raising your children phase, right? So somewhere up till around 37 to 55, you can keep yourself pretty busy just doing that. Yeah. So very commonly, I see people come to me somewhere in that age bracket, 37 to 55. And they're like, oh, this is not going the way I want it to. And the reality is that the unexamined, unnegotiated relational dynamics are, they're going to require you to go kind of all the way back to the beginning. And many people are resistant to this because they don't want to rehash the past. And I get it. I get it. Because we all, we've all done bad things. We've all done things that we're not proud of. But there's a bit of a, a like, I do not believe that continually rehashing the past actually helps. In fact, we can re-traumatize ourselves in just like continually doing that. On the other hand, you do something that I find so remarkable that helps us continually negotiate and move forward as we grow and change. And that is that you don't ask me to get over it and pretend that the version of you who hurt, who hurt mm. me didn't ever exist. Mm. But the, the, the other side of that is I have to hold it lightly. So this is where like, I, I believe we have negotiated this well. Mm. Um, I think we've learned to. You stand in that reality that you are both this person who has grown up more and has done your work and has made restitution and has worked efforted to be a, a, a human who can better relate to me. And you also just, you'll stand in it and be like, that was me. That was me who hurt you that way. That was, it was me. And my response to that is it was, it was you and it's not you. And it's not you now. I know that that was you then. I appreciate that you can see that that's where one of my wounds came from. I'm so grateful that you've been doing this work to get to a new place. Kind of cry again. Ah, <laughs> maybe, um, maybe this whole season will just be how many times just, uh, yeah. we make him cry. Um, because it's, uh, yeah, it's a yucky place to stand. But the thing is this. But is without standing there, I'm not relating to you because you You're are not feeling that. To you. I'm not, and I'm not relating to me. Yes. If so, you who uh, was there, like, it's like disowning the previous versions of yourself. How are you supposed to heal those versions and really right. grow without acknowledging all the versions of you who have existed? The way I think about it, if I if if those parts don't grow too, so then they stay frozen in time. Then they stay frozen, and I've I've had pieces frozen and then thawed. That holds its own set of problems right. when those pieces are like, oh, here I am. Uh-oh. Now you have to deal with all the stuff that you shoved aside. 
or I guess you could die without ever unlocking them, but I, I, I know a guy who did that. Yeah, I, I don't, I would rather relate to you and relate to me and relate to the other people in my life, including the kids. Um, well, to be clear, I do this, I have to do this all the time too. Yeah. So I have less, there are fewer things that I wind up apologizing to you for because of how things played out and because of how that I was because when I got to you, I was like already, oh my gosh, I need to learn how to relate better. So I was like in that all the time. And because our power dynamic was really, really hierarchical That's... where you were holding most of the power. So it was harder for and... me to harm you. Not impossible. Not impossible, but harder. And that's and I what I, I wanted to say is that, right, there was this power differential and it was big and it was unacknowledged by me. You're like, hey, this is going on. I'm like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. So we never had the conversations about how is this going to work? Right. And the, as a result, that is where most, if not all, of the hurt that I did to you came from. It right. came from not addressing these this the power exchange. So the, I, I wanted to say though, like I don't feel I don't feel distant from this at all. I wind up doing this all day, every day. I, you know, there are I, I raise children. Mm -hmm. I have, I have caused harm, a lot of it from being unreflective or not understanding what I was doing, but plenty of it from having bad days and not taking appropriate care of myself, not yeah. resourcing myself well enough, lots of reasons. And some of it just because my own children were trying to raise, my inner children were trying to raise children, a million reasons, but none of that absolves me from the actions I took. Um, and I clearly remember the first time I was faced with the decision to not just apologize to a child for what I had done once, but to really stand there and be like, yes, it was me. And, and I see the role that I have played in the harm that you are now spending years trying to untangle and just be there while they felt a way about it. Yeah. And it is hard. It is. And it is what there is to do. And when I see people do this in their big relationships i i've seen things that seem absolutely insurmountable be become totally manageable totally manageable mm -hmm. because they made power really visible and it changes everything that changes everything i don't think that this is a simple thing i do not believe that this is something that can be accomplished in a like in an event I don't believe you can sit down to have a conversation and come to like completion practices, right? In, These in are... Because mm -hmm. now like yeah. layers of healing happen, layers of growth happen and we're changing. So getting comfortable with, with having these conversations and with owning the fact that we have caused harm is absolutely integral to being a, a conscious relator. I'm really grateful that you you model that for me all the time now. Uh, now I'm thinking about the, um, you mentioned aftercare for arguments. Yeah. So what I hear you describing right now, I'm hearing it as that's aftercare for whatever went wrong, for whatever the, the it's long, Yeah, it's like the a long problem, game. Like it's a long game of aftercare. Um, and yeah, so an apology, useful, helpful. There are, you know, pieces yep. to the apology. Yeah, good apology yep. is worth learning how to do, but it's insufficient. But it's but that's just resolving. That's just opening the problem. door. That's yeah. opening the door to being able to do the things that you're describing that right. allow the relationship to heal and the people to heal and move on to what's next. Right. So accountability for me is all about can I hold myself accountable to to being in that process. To not just apologizing, but then being in the process yeah. of, yep, I, I hear you, I'm with you. Let I and and I will I will participate in the care that you need. Yeah. And and on the short term, because so that's like the long game, years at this point. We're talking about we're yeah. in our 14th year. Um, but on the short term, having strategies, having pre-negotiated aftercare for um not just fights, but disruptions. I mean, one of the negotiated pieces of aftercare in our relationship is when I'm 
teaching, whenever I am doing big teaching, where I'm in front of a group and I'm putting myself out there and I'm being really present for whatever shows up, um, afterward, I negotiated with you because the, the very next thing I want is a full body, forehead, tummy, knees hug. I want like the whole thing. I just, and I, I really want that for, yeah, 30 to 45 seconds because my whole nervous system re-regulates then. And I, I leave this space where I felt like I was way out there and I all of a sudden, oh, I'm here. It's really not about our relationship at all. Though sometimes you're in those settings, you're in the place yeah, but witnessing, it's... but not always. It's just a chance for my nervous system to remember that I am not actually an exposed wire out in the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm really lucky that we happen to live in a place where we both work from home. So that's possible on a, on an almost immediate basis, more often than not. Um, but there are so many ways, micro moments of aftercare that is negotiated and, and revisited over time have made it so that it's a genuine pleasure and doesn't feel like I have to. So in fact, you can read my mind, right? <laughs> like, pre-negotiation is another yeah way. That, well like we pre-negotiated that you know that that's what i'm looking for and so while i could come and ask you for that tummy to tummy hug instead you often are standing at my doors just waiting for me to open them for the you know 30 seconds it takes for me to close my computer and stuff and come over and one minute later the whole the whole world for me has been reset and you have stepped into our agreement. And so I also feel like seen and heard. And I feel your presence as a person who's like, I'm in relationship to you. And it's a small move. It's a very small move, but it's so genuinely has healed the part of me that my parents couldn't do well. They could not. They, they did not have the capacity to show up for me in that way when I was dysregulated at all. Like they, they really, really couldn't. Both of them were challenged um in that way and so it has been so deeply reparenting for me to be like oh look there's somebody waiting because he already knows that i'm looking for comfort then and that was about building a routine a habit of reconnection right a routine of reconnection we could call that a ritual because it has a very specific right. purpose yep. it has a very specific time it's played out in a very specific way and if if we're not in the same space, if we're not in meet space, we're in distant spaces, then I would text you. Yep. And I would only expect a heart back, but like that being seen gives me a touch point. These are the small negotiations that have made it so that I absolutely love um, our power dynamic. And I love being able to call out how we share power, how we share it, and we we build the thing that we want to do. I think it it makes perfect sense that this episode is about power exchange and you refer to it as power dynamics i think that's really like even more broad um and what we've been talking about is explicit agreements little ones little teeny ones some some of them are big ones but some of them are little ones and um yeah of course that's the under underpinnings and that you... make the relationship continue to grow and the people continue to grow while all the power dynamics play out. And you noticed many years ago, you noticed that the hardest part about our agreements wasn't making them for you, it was keeping them. Oh yeah. Because you you had a a, a reactance. You didn't you mm -hmm. didn't want to even tell yourself what to do. So if it was something you'd agreed to I am you the did last the person who I will, you know, uh, hold up my agreements to. And I, I, in this case, though, I'm just holding you up as an example. You yeah. had incredibly high reactance levels, like oh. on the, like oh, yeah. open up the DSM, like we could mm -hmm. classify it as okay. oppositional defiance disorder. It was so, so flat out. And you have done a lot of nervous system work. You've done a lot of um, analysis. You've done a lot of coaching, and now here we are. And I, I don't find that to be a day to day problem anymore. You you can hold yourself in integrity now. And I will so say that, need to. So, so that is a combination of the things that you just mentioned and practice, practice, agree, hold up, agree. Yeah, and the willingness to be called out when it wasn't happening. Oh, yes, must there were be able years to. Because where I'm like, well, we made this agreement. Oh, no, here's all the reasons happen. why 
I would make excuses and that's rather the, than just stand in the, I said I was going to do it and I didn't do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Explaining never helped in those moments. Yeah. So when you stopped explaining, although it's still, you're like, that's the place where you're most likely to struggle. I want you to know who I am. I've been cool, cool. I'd like to know who you are, but let's just resolve this situation. And acknowledge yeah. that. And acknowledge that. And take because me take responsibility for what because I can't actually happened. power share with it, with you unless I acknowledge how much power I have and that was my big fall down in our early relationship mm -hmm. was I couldn't feel how much power I had and so I imagined that I had none which left me in a victim mentality for mm. a couple of years well about it was about eighteen months. And when I stepped out of that, things could really, really finally start being a relationship instead of caught in the drama triangle, which is not a fun place to hang out. No. It's not. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. If you are struggling with power dynamics um, and power sharing, this is such a big conversation. I welcome your questions. We will make follow-up episodes about this. And sure. we're going to have uh, an episode coming up with well, one of the authors of Playing With Others. And I'm hoping to entice Melina to talk about power and exchange in that realm, in the kink realm as well. So Exciting. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll talk to you again soon. There's no one right way to design your relationship. And lots of people, actually about 25%, according to a recent national survey, are interested in some type of open relationship. But how do you know if you are ready to open up happily? Not everyone is, and that's no problem. I've got a 60 second quiz that will give you the answer. And even better, you'll walk away with your next step, whether you're good to go or not so much when it comes to opening up. And this is no BuzzFeed nonsense. I personally designed this quiz from my years of academic research. Go to joliquiz.com. That's J-O-L-I-Q-U-I-Z.com and find out if you're ready to open up happily and what to do if you are or if you're not.